There is no place like home. I know that when I'm away on a trip somewhere and staying in a hotel and sleeping in a different bed and it's just not that comfortable and the surroundings are different and I just never sleep as well as I do at home. Any, any of you experience that? And then when I you know, get home and get back into my own bed and, and it feels the way I like it to, to feel and it's comfortable and I'm back with my family and I'm back in my home and, and, and around the people that I love and, and I you know, love coming back home and, and no place is like home. And uh, it reminds me of Bill Bo Baggins, who wanted to get home too. You know, he wanted to get back to the Shire, you know, where it's comfortable, where, where things are, are nice. But in reality, <clears throat> we live out of place in this world. Yeah, our home here where we live, a house that we live in, that, that's nice and, and it's comfortable, but overall, the reality of our lives is that, that we just don't feel Something's not right. It's like we don't necessarily belong here. I mean, it's like, do we belong to a world where there's disease and where there's hurt and there's pain and there's poverty and there's all this violence? It just something seems like out of place, like we're maybe not in the place where we belong. And then other people would say, well, this is just a result of natural selection and the survival of the fittest and this is the way it goes. Get used to it. But I think... Down deep in our hearts, we know that there is something else. There's something that we're missing. In Ecclesiastes 3.11, it says that God has set eternity in our hearts. We long for something better, something that lasts forever, something that is eternal and something that is peaceful and joyful and full of love. That's what we're all longing for in our hearts. And you know, when Bilbo Baggins got back to the Shire, he found out, you know what, actually, this isn't the what I was expecting. And that's kind of like us here on earth. This just isn't, we're just not in the place we're supposed to be. And if you reflect on it, you go back to the beginning in the Garden of Eden. Okay, that was home. It was paradise. But then Adam and Eve make the wrong choice. They sin. They, they eat of the fruit that's forbidden. And they are cast out. They're now exiles outside of the garden. And that's exactly what we're experiencing now. Yeah, we, <clears throat> we enjoy a lot of things in this world, but it's like we're in exile. It's like we're not home. We're not in the place where we are meant to be. But Christmas is how God intervened into this world to get us back home and to get us to a place where we belong. And we're going to look at Isaiah again this morning. We're going to look at his prophecy 700 years before Christ, and he prophesies about this, this coming Messiah and what it's going to be like when he brings in his kingdom. And if you remember, prophecy in the Old Testament is kind of like you know two mountains you look at off in the distance, and they look like they're right next to each other, but the smaller one's in front of the larger one, and it's just they're actually distance apart, and then we see that in the prophecies in the Old Testament, that there's the initial fulfillment, and then later on, another full fulfillment, but when we read it, they seem to be <clears throat> right next to each other, and so that's what we're looking at this morning. We're going to see in Isaiah chapter 35 that Christmas and the promise, the promises of, of the hope and the salvation that we are going to experience brings us a healed land, healed hearts, healed bodies, and healed sin natures. So that is the hope that we have to look for. So let's look at Isaiah 35, 1 through 2, and look at the hope of a healed land. And Isaiah, he's going to peer into the future. He's got his spiritual binoculars on that the Holy Spirit has given to him. He is seeing what is ahead, and this is what he says in Isaiah 35, verse 1. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. And so he's talking about the picture of the desert and the wilderness. It's barren. There isn't uh, any flowers. There isn't the crocus. There isn't any growth there. 
that is appealing, but when, it, when Messiah comes back, he's going to bring this, this time of healing in the land. It's going to be fertile. It's going to be like Lebanon and Carmel and Sharon, where there were fertile lands, and you could grow a lot of crops and things. So, so imagine going through West Texas, where, you know, deep West Texas, where you just don't see much of anything, and seeing beautiful flowers growing and seeing, you know, vegetation and, and seeing just all this life. Well, someday that's, that's what it's going to be like. Even without uh, irrigation, it's just going to be beautiful. And imagine being in Houston in the summertime, and it's not 105 degrees and 105% humidity. It's, it's going to be wonderful here on this earth. And that's what the hope that we have that is, that is going to be coming. There's going to be joy. There's going to be singing like never before. People are going to be happy and joyous. So no more grumpy Gary. No more bitter Betty. No more sulking Sam. And you can put whatever you want in front of your name and my name because we, we have a lot of those attributes here in this life. And it, it's just going to be different. It's going to be so amazing. We're going to have a healed land. It's going to be a place filled with awe. Where we're going to be worshiping. Our God, we're going to be saying what it says in the book of Revelation. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was, who is, and who is to come. We're going to be singing that joyfully to him. We are going to sing, worthy are you, Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and they were created. That's what it's going to be like. We need, we need to put our minds into that future and imagine that and enjoy that. Imagine planting a garden where you don't have to, to weed it. Imagine planting a garden where you don't need any miracle grow. You just don't have to get any of that stuff. No fertilizer. It just grows, and the fruit that you taste just tastes amazing. So now, when is this? when will this happen? In verse 4, it says, when God comes to save you. So the question is, is that still future or has it already happened? And the answer is yes and yes. You say, what do you mean by that, Mike? Well, Jesus Christ has already started healing the land, the initial fulfillment. Think about when Jesus was here, when he was in the boat out on the lake and he's there sleeping, got his head on, on the cushion, sleeping there, sound asleep. And then the storm comes, and the disciples are, you know, they're just fearful, and they're bailing out the water, and they're scared. And they're, then they're saying, Jesus, wake up, get us out of this. Why don't you care what's going on? And they're, they're all in a mess. They're just scared out of their, their wits. And then Jesus gets up and says, peace, be still. He gives us a picture of what he's going to do permanently and what he can do right then and there. And so you, you see that through his, his healing hand. And, you know, one day there's going to be a, a, a place where there's not going to be tornadoes, hurricanes. Uh, there, there's not going to be, uh, I, th I don't think there's going to be mosquitoes either. I I'm de definitely want those out of here. I think it's just going to be a glorious place. The world's going to be healed. The lion's going to lay down with the lamb. The leopard's going to, to lie down with a young goat, and the child's going to lead them. That's what it says in Isaiah. And because of Christmas, that's the hope that we have. I think about our brother George, who's gone on to be with the Lord, and, and my mother-in-law, who's gone on to be with the Lord. And what they are experiencing now it is just you know, beyond our comprehension. And we need to, we need to dream a little bit. We need to actually dream a lot more. We need to actually be a little more heavenly-minded so we can be a little more earthly good. You know, sometimes people say, oh, you're too heavenly-minded to be earthly good. It's really the opposite. We're just, we just need to be more heavenly-minded. We need to dream about planting that garden that doesn't have weeds. We need to dream about getting rid of flood insurance. Wouldn't that be great getting rid of, getting rid of wind insurance and, and just enjoying that? And you know, all those conversations that we could be having are when we speak of things going on here on earth and how tough it is and garden and the insurance and all that, we can, as we talk among ourselves and our family and our friends, we can always be pointing to the future when that is going to be healed 
And the reason that it's going to be healed is because of Christmas. Christmas and Easter. So we have this amazing hope that there's going to be a healed land. But not only that, not only a healed land, there's going to be healed hearts. Healed hearts. No more anxiety. No more worry. Anyone stressing out here this morning? Yeah, anyone, anyone feeling it this week? It's going to be gone. It's going to be an amazing time. Let's read in verses uh, 3 through 4. It says this, Strengthen the weakened hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God, and he will come and save you. God is going to come and strengthen their anxious hearts. You see, right now, Israel is just going through so much turmoil, and the nations around them are breathing down their necks. They're, they're ready just to choke them out, and they're, they're just fearing for their lives. But he says the Lord's going to come back. He's going to take care of all of that. He is, is, is going to, to lift you up, and you don't have to have that anxiety. You don't have to have that worry. And you know, we don't have to have that anxiety now. We have the Spirit of God, a foretaste of heaven the person of the Holy Spirit in ourselves right now that points us to that future to take away that stress. So if you're feeling stressful this morning, I'm looking at your faces and trying to see if there's any stress this morning. Okay, some of you got that kind of that, that good smile and that fake smile, but we're, we're, we're looking to see what God's going to do. Do you ever, you ever feel kind of irritable, stressed out? Oh, I hear some, I hear some laughter here <laughs> this morning. I was experiencing that this week where I'm getting, you know, to becoming grumpy Mike. And my wife pointed it out to me. And I had to go back to prayer. I had to go back to the Lord and say, you know, I don't need to have this stress because you have it all in your hands. It's all in your control. And sometimes we get stressed out at Christmas time. I got to buy another present. So we only got a week left. And everyone's frantic and crazy. But we don't need to have that. We don't have that stress and that worry. We have healed hearts. We have the Holy Spirit in our hearts if we put our faith in Christ. And one of my favorite passages, one of the passages that really impacted me early on as a Christian was Matthew 11, 28 through 30, where Jesus says, My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's read that. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. I don't know if any of you fit that description here this morning. Come to me, Jesus says, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Anyone find any encouragement from that this morning? His yoke. Now, what is the yoke? What does that mean? Like the, the yoke inside of an egg? I don't get it. No, no, no. Okay, you got to go back in time to, to when you had the oxen that would be plowing in the field, and they had the yoke around the two oxen around their necks, and the older oxen would guide the younger oxen and would do you know, most of the work, and the younger oxen is learning how, how to, to plow in that field. Well, that's the, the picture here is Jesus said, look, I'm the old guy. I've got it taken care of. Actually, he's not old. Actually, he's, he's quite young, and with, that, with plenty of strength and power, and he said, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to pull you along. I'm going to guide you. You've got the easy yoke. Just rest in me. My burden is light. And I love this, this quote. It says, where worry begins, faith ends. And where faith begins, worry ends. So faith and worry are just the, the opposites. And, and there's a study that, that has shown that an average person's anxiety is focused on 40% of things that will never happen. 30% of things about the past that can't be changed. 12% about things that are, are about criticism by others, mostly untrue. 10% about health, which gets worse with, with stress. And 8% about real problems that will be faced. So really, 92% of your, your stress and my stress, we, we can just throw that out. And then we just take that 8% and we hand it off to the Lord and we trust in him. I think about our, our church situation here with, with the building. 
And for so many years, we felt like, okay, we're going to be out. No, the Lord comes in the last second. Oh, okay, we're all right. And then here again, we are again. Oh, it looks like we're out. Oh, no, here comes the Lord again. We're back here to stay again. And so as I was talking to, to Alice Diaz the other day, and she really encouraged me, and she said, you know, the Lord's got this. He's got this. And I think you can just say that to yourselves and just say, you know, Lord, I know you, you've got this. Whatever it is in your life, you turn it over to him, you just pray and put it into, into his hands. And his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Wouldn't it be enjoyable to have rest today? Wouldn't you enjoy to have that today? You can do that. Turn it over to him today in faith and in prayer and enjoy that, that healed heart from anxiety. And then thirdly, after we experience, you know, the healed land, the healed heart, and then healed bodies. Uh, that is, is going to be a great experience. And the Lord does this healing even now in this time, in this age. Let's read what it says in verses 5 through 7. It says, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. For waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert, and burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. In the haunt of jackals where they lie down, the grass shall become reeds and rushes. Now, do you know who maybe could have quoted this in the New Testament? Sunday school answer? You got it. You are correct. All right. You get candy and a donut, all right, fat-free, no no calories, all right, you, you, yeah, miraculous. So you, you get, I mean, you, he says here in Matthew, in the Gospel of Matthew, he quotes this, and it's when, when John the Baptist was in, put in prison. Now, now, John the Baptist was the forerunner before Jesus, and he was preaching a baptism of repentance, pointing people towards Jesus, getting them prepared for the coming Messiah, and people are being converted, and people are being baptized, and, and you know, he says, you know, I must decrease, he must increase, and he's pointing everyone to Jesus, and then he gets put into prison, and he had been proclaiming Jesus as the Christ, and then he's put in prison, and all of a sudden he gets a little discouraged. A little bit of despair comes into his life, and this great prophet that, that Jesus, you know, highly, highly uh, regards, sends messengers to him, and they, they say to, to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist is asking a question. He wants to know, are you the Christ, or should we expect someone else? You ever gone through depression like that, where you ever have, had doubts about the Lord and struggled? John the Baptist struggled. It's okay. You can get through this. He can give you your faith and strengthen you. And so what did Jesus do to encourage John the Baptist? He quoted this verse right here in Isaiah 35, and he said, look, the blind are, are seeing, the deaf are hearing, the lame are walking. Yes, I am the Messiah. Yes, I am the, the one who is to come. And he sent word back to him, and it was just amazing to see how Jesus handled that and encouraged him with that. And, and Jesus was, was the master of, uh, of healing bodies. Uh, there's over 30 healings recorded in the New Testament. And then if you go to the end of the book of John, John says that, you know, if we were to record all of it, it would fill up the books of the world. There's so many things that, that, that Jesus did. One of my favorite healings is in John chapter 9, when Jesus healed a man that was born blind. Remember how he did that? Spit in the mud and put mud in his eyes and said, go wash your eyes in the pool of Siloam. Jesus uses a lot of variety in his healing. That, that was interesting. And, then he, and he can see, and he's praising God. And he did so many miraculous healings. What was, what was maybe one of your favorite healings? You can answer this one this time. What's a favorite healing that, in the Bible that you liked, that Jesus did? The crippled man. What's another one? Touched his garment, yeah. She had the issue of blood, yeah. That was amazing. What's another one? One more. The ten lepers, yes. And only one came back to thank him. And so Jesus Christ did all these amazing miracles, and he healed bodies, and he still does that today. 
we prayed for Justin for uh, for a long time, and Justin has been healed. Did God work through doctors as well? Yes, but I still think absolutely that the healing and the glory all goes to, to Jesus Christ. And there is a day where we're going to experience this complete healing. Revelation 21, verse 4 says this, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Now, how do we know that that's going to come true? Because Jesus Christ is the first fruits of resurrection. He's the first one ever to be raised with a glorified body, the first one ever to come back to life from the dead, to never die again and never have any maladies, diseases, or problems. Jesus Christ is the first one ever, and now he guarantees that this is going to be the place that we are going to be part of one day with healed bodies. So imagine not having a cold ever again. Imagine never having the flu ever again. Imagine never having a broken bone, insomnia, cancer, heart disease. It's gone. Anyone want to sign up for that? Yeah, I think you ought to sign up with that. You have to sign up with Jesus in order to get that. That's what he promises. And then you go and go through these things now, though, in life, the difficulties and when we do have the, the struggles with our bodies with that hope that if there's the Lord's will, he'll heal us now, and we've seen that, and he will continue to do that, but ultimately he's going to heal us in the resurrection. So Christmas is wonderful. just points to this healed land, these healed hearts, these healed bodies. But you know what the best one is? Healed sin natures. No more sin. Wouldn't it be wonderful to be released from all those lusts and desires and selfishness and anger and violence and despair and be released from all that? That's the hope that we have that Jesus Christ fulfills. Let's look at verses 8 through 10. He says, And a highway shall there shall be there, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. No lions shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come up on it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed, the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads, and they shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Now, who are the only people that are going to walk on this road of holiness? The ransomed and the redeemed. The ransomed and the redeemed will be there. Now, what does it mean to be redeemed? Redeemed means to be, to be bought out of the slave market of sin. You know, back in the day when there, there was slavery, and uh, you know, I guess there's still slavery in other parts of the world, but sometimes people would buy slaves and buy them out of slavery. They would redeem them. And we were in the slave market of sin, and God bought us out of that slave market of sin brought us and bought us and restored us. And it's like the, the story of Peter Cropper back in uh, 1981 at London's Royal Academy. He was given the opportunity to, to play this amazing violin, the Stradivarius, that was handcrafted by Antonio Stradivari 258 years early, earlier. And it was just this masterpiece of a violin. And, and so he had the opportunity to play in the, the London Royal Academy of Music. And so he stepped on the stage to play, and he tripped. And he fell over, and he broke the neck off of the, the violin. And he was inconsolable. He was so upset. He, he just could not believe what had happened. There was just this rare violin that plays this amazing music. And so he took it to a master craftsman, just hoping that it could be fixed. And the master craftsman was able to fix 
and repair that violin. And the Royal Academy kept allowing him to play. And he played in the, the music. And, and it, it was just a story of redemption, story of restoration. And that's the way we are. We're broken, broken sinners who have turned our way uh, from the Lord. We have broken his laws. We, we have, we're so far from him, but he, through Jesus Christ and through the Holy Spirit, has restored us. And so you can be redeemed this morning if you've never been redeemed. You can be bought out of that slave market of sin and be put into the family of God. Ephesians 1, 7 says this, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. And in verse 13 it says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire the possession of it to the praise of his glory. So you can be redeemed this morning by putting your faith and your trust in him and in the gospel. That Jesus Christ died for you. He was buried. He rose on the third day. He's now back up in heaven. You put your faith in him, your confidence in him. He comes into your life. He saves you. He puts your name in the Lamb's book of life. You're now on your way to heaven. You have eternal life. You have the spirit of God now living inside of you to give you that peace and that joy and that spiritual growth that you need. And so I urge you to do that this morning. You see, that brings the Spirit of God into our lives now. But we still have a flesh. We still have this battle going on inside of us. Our old nature, the flesh versus the Spirit. Anyone experience that? Any, anyone have any struggles? Any, a couple of you? So two of us and me, all right. I, I, you know, guys, are, you're very holy. There's a holy group here this morning, so just sometimes they're, they're very holy when you preach to them. Yeah, uh, struggle between the flesh and the spirit. Paul said he had that struggle. You might want to join up with Paul. But uh, we have the struggle, the flesh, and the spirit. So we're in the be in between time. Where, yeah, we've got the taste of heaven. We've got the Holy Spirit in our hearts. But we still got the old Adam, the old sin nature. We're in this battle, in this struggle, longing for that time when that will all be taken away. And the promise is here in Isaiah 35 the ransom, the redeemed, the walk on that road of holiness, and those, that sin nature is going to be taken away. And we'll no longer have desire to lust or to be selfish or to have greed or, or to be mean or to be angry or to be worrying all the time. We'll have redeemed and ransomed bodies and souls and hearts, and we'll be with him there forever. And the, and the Spirit of God is working on us now, pointing us, reminding us, that's, a, that's our home. That's our future. That's what we need to be living for. Now, imagine what that would look like, living in a world where there are people who don't have any sin natures. Would that change our driving, you think? Imagine living in a world with, with drivers like that, driving down the road, and you need to make that left-hand turn. You've got to go across those two lanes, and you've got all this traffic. They're stopped. All they have to do is just stop and open up a lane for you to to make your left hand turn, right? You've ever experienced that, but they just stay there? In this new world, no, they open it up, and you just drive through it, and you wave. Ah, it's just a joyful world. And then, then when you're driving down the road, you know that person that's always just on your tail? Like, I mean, so close. Like, hey, you, you're going to hit me from behind. No, nice distance in between you and them. I mean, this is going to be an amazing world. And then, then you're going to see all these signs that say, honk if you love Jesus. All right? They're going to be all over. And then people are going to be honking all over, but it's going to sound like a symphony. It's going to be beautiful. That's what I dream of. I don't know if it's going to be exactly like that. But you dream of that, that amazing promise that we have of having redeemed hearts. No more anger. No more road rage. None of those things is gone. And when we can have that anticipation, it changes us now. I compare it to November of 1996 when Sean and I went up, flew up to, to New York and stayed with my parents. And then one evening, I took her to Niagara Falls. And we, we went into this uh, restaurant that rotates around a circle overseeing the falls. And then afterwards, I got, we went back to the falls 
It was pretty cold, actually. And, uh, she, and I got down on one knee and asked her to marry me. And then we had a date set for May 10th of the next year to get married. And from that, that time forward until May 10th, I just had so much anticipation, so much joy. I couldn't wait to where I could actually, we could actually live in the same house. We could be married together. We, we could have just enjoyed all the blessings that God has given us through marriage. And I was just kind of walking on air a couple inches off the ground. You know, people are walking by, and they could see me walking a couple inches off the ground, you know, driving down the road. Someone cuts me off. And I said, that's okay. I'm marrying Sean Smith on May 10th. Go ahead. Cut me off. No problem. It's okay. We're in the end, then, we, then the day of the wedding, and people are saying, man, he had such a huge smile on his face. I don't know how he, it's like bigger in his face. And I was just waiting in anticipation of that day that we could get married. And you know what? That's just kind of like what it is now for us. We have the Lord. Uh, we've gotten down on our, our knee and said, Lord, Jesus, I need you. I'm trusting you to save me. And, and we, we've got a date set. There is the, the wedding supper of the Lamb, it says in the Bible, a day when we are, as a bride, are going to meet our groom, the Lord Jesus Christ. So how do we act now? Well, we walk a couple inches off the ground. Well, actually, about 12 or 24 away up there off the ground. Because we've got Christ in our life, we can walk in anticipation because Christmas. Christmas and Easter. And we can allow those worries and those cares to be so small. Because we know that we are going to meet up with him. And that healing is going to be complete when we're with him. We don't, we'll have a healed land. We'll have healed hearts, healed bodies, and no longer have sin. That is the place where we're going. But we're in exile right now. But we can wait with hope, with joy. Now you may say, Mike, how, how can I apply this? into my life? How can I bring this healing into my life now? Because I have the Spirit. Well, I'm glad you asked that question because Jesus said in John 17, your word is truth. Sanctify them. With, so set them apart by your word. We have the word of God. We have the Bible. Acts 17, 11 says, Paul brought the word to the Bereans, and they were more noble than the Thessalonians because they searched the scriptures daily. Daily they search the scriptures. Proverbs 4, 20 through 22 says, My son, be attentive to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Let them not escape from your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and healing to all their flesh. So God's word is healing. It, it, it changes our minds. It changes our hearts. It changes our whole life. So what I want to do is encourage you, strongly encourage you this, these next two years to go through the two-year Bible reading program. Really, every Christian should read, should have read through all the scriptures and, and should make that a, a, a goal. So I'm going to challenge you starting on January 1st. You can get started a little bit early now if you need to. You go to Bible.com. You search for the two-year Bible reading program. You go to Uversion app, two-year Bible reading program. Set that up, and we can have a, a conversation. We can have a community and be talking about those scriptures we're reading. Two chapters a day is about all it is. Five minutes in the morning, five minutes in the evening, ten minutes in the morning, fifteen minutes, and just bring that word into your life. Bring the healing and start experiencing a little bit more of home, our real home in our lives now. Because there's no place, there's no place like home. 